Hey everyone, great to have you back. This video is a simple explanation of the difference between force and leadership. We've been exposed to a lot of propaganda over our lives, and two of the millions of messages we've been told to believe in is society needs leaders, and that's why we have government, and a workplace needs leaders, and that's why we have bosses. These claims are an insult to real leaders and an insult to those of us who don't need leaders. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. Let's start with what it means to be a leader. And I get these definitions from personal experience. You can add your own. I've worked with a lot of leaders. I've observed a lot of others, mostly in my early 20s when I would thought that I would spend most of my life in an office. <laughs> Here are five things I've noticed. First, a leader has vision. It might be the vision that the leader came up with alone, although a better one is one that they formed with the whole group that they're going to be working with. But as long as the group agrees with the vision, they might choose to follow the leader. Follow here, of course, doesn't mean blindly following like a sheep. You have the opportunity to follow and consider the vision uh, or the leaders themselves and choose whether or not to follow. And you can always opt out at any time. That's another important aspect of leadership, that submitting to it is purely voluntary. And while we're on the subject, if you're white like me, you might want to be the leader and the talker, but if you're organizing with indigenous people or black people, it's okay to let them lead. They probably have more perspective and more experience, and if they don't, build them up. Leaders have teams, and strong leaders have strong teams. They might spend time on team-building exercises, uh, get to know everyone on the team and see what are the best ways that everyone can work together. A leader builds up the members of their team, helping them learn or access the resources that they need. They don't hold on to information or resources for their own power. Leaders make decisions, often the toughest decisions, and they need to make them for the good of the vision or the team and its goals. They might make them alone or with the team. Again, a collaborative approach is better, but leaders take responsibility either way. And finally, because something could always happen to a leader, like dying or going to prison or just wanting to retire, leaders create new leaders who can replace them whenever it's necessary. They don't concentrate authority and then coast on charisma. They don't jealously guard their power. They set things up so anyone who's ready can take the reins. So, pretty simple criteria. Again, if you disagree, that's okay. Feel free to say so in the comments. But we've been told all our lives that we need leaders in the form of government and bosses. Do you think the criteria I've just mentioned describe those people? Do bosses have vision? Well, some of them do. Visions and mission statements are often plastered all over the office. But do they actually care about their vision? The incentives in the corporate world are not to follow some lofty vision to make the world a better place. The boss's incentive is to make as much profit as possible in the short term and grab as much of that for themselves as possible. So the vision might be to change the world, but then it's just rhetoric. 
Or the vision might be to maximize shareholder value. Totally uninspiring, but realistic. What about in government? Well, not that different. They may have vision, but their job is to work for the richest and most powerful people. Unless their vision is to make the rich richer and the poor poorer, they're going to fail. Number two is about being voluntary, that submitting to a leader is voluntary and you can opt out. So do we voluntarily submit to the leadership of the boss or the state? Hell no! Our relationship with the corporation and its agents is largely forced upon us because we're forced by law to make money, and therefore to beg for jobs from people who have all the money. Our relationship with a given boss might be voluntary as we can leave, but unless we have lots of money, we'll still have to work for a boss and follow their orders and watch them make more money and make all the important decisions while we sit at the bottom of the hierarchy and do all the work. And the idea that our relationship to government could be voluntary is laughable. All states exist in an involuntary relationship with their subjects. Number three was about strong teams. Now, on the one hand, you could argue bosses and states create strong teams, but only in their inner circle. They might want a strong executive board or a strong cabinet, but unlike with leaders, strong teams in the boardroom is worse for the rest of us. When the job is to take as much of your labor as possible, or grab as much money and power as possible, or find ways to lie and spin and cover things up, the wider team, employees or citizens, suffers. I don't want to be on a hierarchical team where I'm in an antagonistic relationship with the people at the top. Teams like that do not exist for my benefit. How about making decisions and taking responsibility for them? Well, bosses and politicians certainly make decisions, but instead of making them with us, they make the decisions for their own benefit and impose them on the rest of us. Then if things go awry, they blame someone else or muddy the waters. Mistakes were made, but they're being fixed. We've conducted an internal investigation and found no evidence of wrongdoing, etc., etc. Politicians particularly never take responsibility. They can't. If they actually admitted what they did, they'd be removed from office at the next opportunity. In fact, just saying what they actually do in public would expose what the state really does and what it is, and the propaganda won't allow for that. As a result, any problem we think government is supposed to solve gets passed on to the next government. They avoid hard decisions because their handling of things, just the decision itself, might not get them re-elected. So things get worse and worse until a decision is absolutely necessary. By then, it might be too late, so they blame their predecessors, or Russian spies, or immigrants, or whatever they think will fly with the public. And number five, leaders create new leaders, of course, does not apply to bosses or state officials, because any new leader is a threat to their authority. If I'm a boss or a prime minister and I build up new leaders, they might replace me. There goes my paycheck. In a voluntary community organization, more leaders would be great. It would mean more people to work towards our collective goals. Organizations or movements that exist for the benefit of all their members are organized horizontally. Any member could be a leader, and there isn't even necessarily a, lead, a, a limit to how many leaders there can be. Government and business are organized vertically, hierarchically, like a pyramid. 
So there's, there's always a limit to how many people can make decisions or how much you can pay the people on the bottom and still take away most of the money. Government and business are threatened by new leaders. And if they're any danger to the status quo, they get fired or disgraced or jailed or assassinated, as the case may be. So why do we think of bosses and politicians and others as leaders? I think the simple answer is propaganda. The business world has been calling its people leaders for decades. They created a positive association with the word leader. So politicians started calling themselves leaders too. Now we hear things like, this country needs new leadership which really just means a new political party should be the one doling out state favors to the rich. I wonder if we've also come to believe these people are leaders because of our conf conflation of the two meanings of the word authority. We see them as authorities because authority means government and police. Or, or bosses, someone with whom we have an involuntary relationship. But we also use authority to mean knowing a lot. So we confuse being in a position of power with having got to that position through some kind of intellectual or moral authority. We assume these so-called leaders have the moral authority to tell us what to do, and that chaos would reign if they weren't telling us what to do. I think that's silly, and I've made a bunch of videos about why, but hey, that's what happened when we accept the words of authority as if they were leaders. And with the dual meaning of authority, there's also a dual meaning of the word respect. Respect could mean to treat someone well, uh, to listen to them and consider them equal to you. So you might respect the authority of an elder because they know things and they, they still want the best for you and you should listen. But why would you respect the authority of, say, the police when their job is to use force against you for the benefit of the ruling class? Why respect that position? Why consider it a legitimate authority? Authoritarian rule might be more accurate than leader. I'd like to finish by dispelling one more myth about leaders. Countries or other mass societies do not need leaders. When people aren't subject to force, they organize themselves. They don't need other people telling them what to do to figure out what needs to be done. We naturally work together and help each other and coordinate affairs with each other, which is that much easier now in the digital age. Leaders are for small groups, under a hundred people or so, who have specific goals. Mass societies do not have goals. They're just a bunch of people with different interests. Be a leader. Work with leaders. Solve your problems. But please don't confuse leaders with people using force to make money. Thanks everyone for watching. Please subscribe, like, share, comment, whatever you can do. And I'll see you next week.